Good afternoon, friends. My name is Tim Chapin. I have the great pleasure of being the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Public Policy here at Florida State University. Um, we're very pleased you've joined us for our kickoff policy pub for, uh, for the college. Um, we're calling them policy pubinars this fall because normally we hold these events over at Backwoods Bistro on Tennessee Street in person, but we're not doing that right now. Uh, and the topic tonight will help us understand why. Um, just a bit of uh, history about the Policy Pub. We started this a handful of years ago and it's designed to bring the expertise of our faculty and students and alumni to uh, the community. Uh, we usually feature uh, one of our faculty uh, giving a talk of about 20 minutes uh, on a topic that is uh, of general uh, interest to the public. Uh, the, the faculty member will present um, uh, from some slides tonight and you'll be hearing from uh, him and I'll introduce him in a little bit. Um, as we go, uh, you may have questions. There's a Q&A button um, that is in, uh, should be on your screen somewhere, depending upon the device you're using. And you can enter questions as we go. And after uh, uh, the, the professor gives his talk, we will have a moderated discussion. Um, that discussion is going to be, not going to be uh, moderated by Associate Dean for the college, uh, Dina Rollinger. Uh, Dr. Rollinger is actually the uh, real force behind the Policy Pub, and I cannot her thank her enough for her uh, leadership and expertise in bringing our ideas out into the community. Again, what the, uh, the flow of events will be about a 20 minute, 25 minute talk, followed by a moderated discussion. Um, I should mention some uh, news that you may have heard or maybe have not heard yet uh, that brings the, tonight's topic even more home. Um, I received word a few minutes ago, and many of you have probably heard that President Thrasher and Mrs. Thrasher have uh, each been uh, diagnosed with COVID. Um, uh, they're resting well, they're doing well, their health is in good shape, um, but it's uh, particularly uh, hitting home for the FSU family in even new ways. I know that our community has not been immune to this pandemic, um, so our uh, topic tonight is particularly um, important to us all for personal reasons, as well as for our own public health uh, and health reasons. Um, with that introduction, um, let me now turn it over to our featured speaker. Tonight's uh, speaker is going to be Dr. Alan Rowan. He's a professor in our Master's in Public Health program and in our Public Health program more generally. Uh, Dr. Rowan is an expert on many, many things, um, but tonight's talk is going to be about uh, pandemics, both past, present, and in the future. Uh, Dr. Rowan, I'm going to turn it over to you to speak tonight on going viral, what we can learn from pandemics past, present, and dot, dot, dot. Dr. Rowan, over to you. Thank you, Dean Chapin. I appreciate the invitation. And, and I, again, I do hope to talk some about the past pandemic, some history, and then hopefully kind of uh, educate us to where we are now. So let's get started. Uh, first, just some uh, definitions. Uh, epidemic is usually uh, some illness, a group of people that have an illness in larger than expected numbers. And a pandemic is that same epidemic more on a global scale. And this seems pretty straightforward, but as we may find later, it's not always as clear cut as you may think. First, a little background. Um, here's a list of past, uh, past pandemics, uh, a list that all of us pretty much agree on. That if you ask the uh, expert epidemiologists, they all agree that these were definitely uh, pandemics in the past and currently. And I'd like you to look at this list. And as you look at it, do you see anything in common among all these pandemics? They're all pandemics. I said they're all infectious diseases, but there's one other element that makes them all in common. And to save time, I'll tell you what that is. They're all zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic diseases are diseases that arise in animals are then transferred to humans and then often pass between humans. But the host and vectors are often animals, and then humans are incidental hosts. Uh, some further examples of that. Here's a, a kind of a random list of other zoonotic diseases. In fact, as I, I looked at it a minute ago, I realized I had left off malaria, which accounts for over a million deaths per year in the, in the, in the, on the globe. And you'll, you'll recognize a lot of these. Uh, Ebola, Lyme disease has become uh, quite well known recently. In fact, six out of 10 human diseases are zoonotic diseases. And that will be helpful as we start to understand pandemics in general.
So I, just to kind of go a little bit narrow on this, on the left is a column of the top eight zoonotic diseases. Um, you'll recognize influenza, which we're gonna talk about, Samolosis, of course, with um, different, especially foodborne outbreaks, turtles, snakes, things like that. And we're gonna to touch on some of these other ones. I'd like you to look at the column on the right, the special zoonotic diseases, category A. Does anybody recognize that? Do you, do you see what all those have in common? Well, uh, those are all bioterrorism agents. Um, and they're also zoonotic diseases. And that's really important. Uh, some examples of that, the first, I'm not gonna go through all of these, they're all fascinating, but they're all uh, diseases that uh, abide in animals and then currently, and then occasionally will pop up randomly in humans. An example of that is the anthrax one at the top. Um, uh, you know, Florida has a special experience with this. Everybody remembers 9-11, September of 2001, but some people forget that that same month in September of 2001, uh, several letters, at least seven letters were mailed out across the United States, particularly the East Coast, uh, containing anthrax. And Florida's involvement was, uh, at least one of the letters went to the AMI building in Palm Beach, Florida, it was opened by an individual who uh, later died from that. And so we began investigating this anthrax death. So it was a public health issue. And then once his colleague also came down with anthrax, it immediately became a criminal investigation and the FBI took it over and they found a, a total of at least seven letters, 18 people ill, five people died from that disease. Uh, it range, age range from seven months to 94 years of age. Uh, and so, these are important issues that we're gonna talk about and just touch on at the end of the presentation. So let's get back to the slide we already looked at. These are past pandemics. Uh, I just wanna go through these uh, quickly, just so you're, you're familiar with these, uh, again, zoonotic diseases. The first one is Black Death, Yersinia pestis, or uh, Black uh, or Plague, or any number of names, 1346. About half of all Europeans died from Yersinia pestis or the plague. Uh, it was 75 to 100 million people died from this. Um, it was a fairly selective uh, uh, killer, tend to be lower class people that couldn't leave the area. Um, and, uh, uh, and it's also another thing I wanna point out is the word quarantine started generally used during this time. A quarantine is an old Italian or really old Venetian word meaning 40 days. And so what would happen is a ship would come into port, Venice, Croatia area, and it would be, it would anchor in the harbor and it would stay there for 40 days, nobody on or off the ship. And at the end of 40 days, they'd roll out there to see either everybody was alive or everyone was dead. And that's uh, how they would enforce that is a quarantine or people that are per, per, uh, might be exposed to a disease as opposed to isolation is people that have been exposed and are ill with the disease. And they're put separately from those that are quarantined. Uh, we actually utilize this same system when I was a contact tracer out in the counties uh, south and east of here. We talked to people and if they had the disease, they'd go into isolation. If they are possibly exposed to COVID-19, they'd have to go in quarantine, uh, not for 40 days, just for 14 days. The next one I want to talk about, it may be familiar to you, the uh, Spanish flu of 1918, 1919, H1N1. This had not been seen previously. The H1N1 had, it was a, a novel virus. It killed, it probably infected over 500 people worldwide, uh, killing at least 50 million people. Over 675,000 people died just in the United States alone. It probably started in Kansas. Uh, and again, you know, the United States got involved in World War I in 1917, and so we're, we're transporting people all around the world for the World War I. Probably early spring 1918, the uh, H1N1 arose. It was an avian flu that went through pigs, then to humans. And as people were transported, the virus was transported as well. Um, Again, uh, uh, mortality was 10 to 20 percent. Uh, it was interesting, people that died from this, uh, as you know, seasonal flu tends to kill the very young, the elderly. It's 
Spanish flu killed those kind of in between. People that were generally healthy in their 20s and 30s were often dying from this. They'd wake up in the morning feeling maybe a little bit uh, uncomfortable, maybe some muscle aches, something like that. And then they would uh, occasionally die on the way to work on the sidewalk or the bus or the train. Uh, it would happen that quickly. And the way they died was particularly gruesome is they would drown on the, or their own bodily fluids, uh, what's called a cytokine storm. The immune system would flood their lungs with fluid and the and individuals would actually die from this. This uh, pandemic went on through 1920 as World War I uh, came to an end and in 1918, uh, it slowly decreased until it finally disappeared later. The next one I'll just go through, this is an Asian flu. This is another a, uh, avian flu from, uh, from birds. They use uh, the RNA from birds. 1957. Uh, this actually started in Singapore in 1957 to Hong Kong, and then that spring got to the United States, uh, and about 1.1 million people died worldwide, about 116,000 here in the U.S. The next one is an H3N2, also an avian influenza, uh, and it started in Hong Kong, as you might guess, and about uh, similar to the earlier one, about just over a million people died, just over 100,000 people here in the US. And again, that's avian influenza. Let me skip over SARS for a minute and come back to that in just a, a moment. Uh, in 2009, 2010, uh, two children in California came down with the flu. And when they typed the flu, they found it was H1N1. Uh, very, the virus was extremely similar to the same H1N1. By the way, H and N is hemagglutinin neuromidase 1, and all those are proteins on the surface of the virus. Because it was very similar to that, people were very concerned at self alarms really around the planet. And soon after that, we found other people in California with it, then Mexico, and then it traveled around the world fairly uh, quickly. It turned out that this wasn't as bad as we uh, feared it might be compared to the Spanish flu. And, and actually, the, the uh, people that died was only just over 12,000 in the US. So it was, it was not really not much worse than seasonal influenza. So uh, we got through that fairly well. And then COVID-19. If I could, let me go back to the, the uh, SARS for a minute. SARS, or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, is uh, uh, more of a respiratory disease. Uh, I first came in to uh, experience this in 2003. I was epidemiologist for the Florida Department of Health. And we kept hearing about this virus, this uh, disease, it turned out later we found out it was coronavirus, that in Guangdong province of China, people were getting sick and people were dying and the Chinese government was saying that it was, they were un had it under control, that it, was, uh, 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 it wasn't spreading. It really, I guess, we, it really caught our eye, though, when uh, a physician, Dr. Carlos uh, Carlo Urbani, was an Italian physician working for the World Health Organization, traveled to Gudong province of China, and then on his return died from SARS. And this kept moving and traveling around the planet, so it really got people's attention. Uh, the Clinical presentation, I just want to touch on two things. Uh, first, the incubation period is two to 10 days. Uh, COVID-19 is two to 14 days. But more importantly, this is a disease of the lower respiratory system as compared to COVID-19, which is a disease of the upper respiratory system. And I'll, I'll get back to that in just a moment. That's, that's very, very important for reasons I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, just quickly, as far as the zoonotic aspect of this, uh, SARS arose from bats. We believe it went to civet cats. Civet cats are, it looks like um, a house cat and a possum had children. That's kind of what a civet cat looks like. And the way humans were exposed was probably in a wet market. Uh, these are um, markets in China. It's people surrounded by cages of animals and they often butcher them right there for you. So if you want uh, meat of a civet cat, they'll butcher it and give you the meat for it and you can take it home and, and, and um, cook it. What you're looking at here though is, is interesting. On the, um, what happened is in uh, February of 2003, a physician from Gudong province traveled to Hong Kong for a wedding and stayed at the Metropole Hotel, which is the building on the right of your slide. 
and began to, began to feel ill at the wedding. He traveled back to Guadong province where he soon died from SARS. The diagram on your left is what we call a super spreader event. Apparently this one individual, this physician, infected a lot of people who then traveled to 29 other countries from Hong Kong, infecting uh, thousands of people from that. One of the people that was infected at the uh, Metropole Hotel was Miss uh, KSC, a uh, 72-year-old 72 year old female who then traveled back to Toronto, Canada, infected four members of her family, and then it spread from there. So we had a large cluster of SARS in Toronto, Canada. At the time, I was the lead epidemiologist for SARS along with an epidemiologist from CDC, and we were tracking this. And we more and more people were calling us reporting the symptoms that you saw earlier, the 100.4 temperature, the cough, the dry cough, and other symptoms. We had probably uh, several, a couple hundred people that we thought were possible, narrowed it down to maybe two dozen, and then with new case definitions, maybe down to eight. In retrospect, we might very well have had uh, perhaps uh, zero actual cases of SARS in Florida. SARS disappeared simply because of public health measures. The wearing of masks where the SARS was serious, social distancing, there was never a vaccine. It was just clamping down on some travel and exposure of the people in isolation and quarantine that brought SARS under control. And then the next year it, it disappeared completely. I just wanna talk about this for a minute. These are the clinical symptoms you, uh, of COVID-19, coronavirus disease 2019. It's also coronavirus. The, uh, the animal vectors for this appear right now to be bats, to a pangolin, although that's, we still don't know that's, that's conjecture at this point, to humans. Uh, similar symptoms, the incubation period is a little bit longer, two to 14 days. The main difference between SARS and COVID-19 is that COVID-19 is an upper respiratory disease. What that means is that people can uh, spread the virus to other people before they even have symptoms. So before they even know they're sick, they can be spreading to disease to other people. They can be standing in Hartsfield International Airport in the hallway, and as people go by heading to all over the world, they could be uh, acquiring the virus in the hallway of, of the airport. Um, when I was doing contact tracing uh, in the eastern counties from here, I talked to people every single day that had, that were positive for COVID. It was actually about 30 to 40% of them were asymptomatic, had no symptoms at all. Another group, maybe a third uh, were felt, didn't feel good, but not too bad. And about a third, uh, we were very concerned about their health and they were under uh, emergency care often going to the hospital, trying to, uh, in some cases, be intubated and in other cases, you know, receiving oxygen to, to, to get well. But the, the critical difference is that uh, ability to spread the disease before they even have symptoms. So what do we know? Well, right now there's uh, about 200 vaccines in development. Four that I, I'm, I'm familiar with here in the U.S. Phase three trials are trials where they're looking and comparing one treatment compared to another treatment. They're also looking at uh, perhaps uh, the safety, there are any tox toxic effects of it and uh, any adverse reactions from that vaccine. So just one quickly I wanna to touch on is one from Johnson & Johnson. They're using a new technique called viral vector vaccines. And what that does is use a harmless adenovirus and they put the harmless proteins from the COVID-19 inside that virus, inject it, and then the body starts reacting to that and develops immunity. Uh, Johnson Johnson is reporting that it only takes uh, one dosage to gain immunity uh, instead of normal two, and that has over a 90% effectiveness rate. So we're going to see if that's the case, if, if that works out uh, after some time. Uh, some things that we're still working on. We don't know when the vaccine will be available for COVID-19. We don't know if COVID-19 will be seasonal. Will it be like uh, influenza that comes every winter? Will it be like uh, uh, other colds, which are also often uh, uh, coronaviruses that 
we get those in the winter time, or will it go away uh, on its own like SARS did and we'll never see it again? We also don't know how long immunity will last. Now we don't know how long immunity will last. Uh, immunity will last either for the vaccines that they're testing now, or for natural immunity. In other words, people that have COVID-19 and recover, how long does their immunity last? And I, I've been hearing a lot just recently about herd immunity. I, I just want to just mention that briefly. Uh, there's only one country that has been rumored to have herd immunity, it's Sweden, and Swe Sweden has officially declared they're not pursuing that as a national policy of uh, herd immunity. The problem with herd immunity is uh, uh, several things. Um, first of all, if you embrace that policy, then what you're saying is that you're accepting the number of people that may die from COVID-19. COVID-19 has approximately a 1% mortality rate. So what we're saying is that in the US, we may have 3 million deaths from COVID-19, over 200,000 in Florida. And, and perhaps even worse are the numbers of people that will become ill from uh, this. Maybe many millions of people will become ill from COVID-19 if we don't do, use protective measures. And what that'll mean is a, a immediately overwhelmed healthcare system where they won't get the care they need, clinicians, will be overwhelmed, become ill. And then those individual citizens who have what we think of as normal emergencies, the you know, car accidents, uh, burst appendix, other injuries, also will have trouble uh, seeing, get, uh, seeking and receiving medical care. Um, and so for those reasons and many more, uh, morally it's difficult to condone the idea of herd immunity. I, I don't wanna talk about that more if anybody has a, a question about that. And then the, the last thing we don't know is who will receive the vaccine initially. Now, you often think clinicians, uh, nurses, PAs, physicians, therapists uh, uh, will get it. Also, those in high risk groups, uh, the elderly, pre existing conditions, and that's, that's maybe accurate. But depending on the supply, we often have a discussion about uh, other people that may be very important. And, and an example of that would be truck drivers. As we all know from hurricanes, when there's a disaster like that, people go to the grocery store and clear off shelves. And you go there the day, you know, the day of a, before a hurricane and the grocery store is empty. If they're not able to that night fill those shelves again, the shelves will stay empty. And so that's why discussions of truck drivers, uh, sanitation workers, utility drivers, all those are often up on the list of people that may be vaccinated against COVID. So what can you do? Well, a lot of this, is familiar to you, the social distancing, wearing masks, washing hands, these work, these actually do work to prevent not just COVID-19, but other infectious diseases as well. This is, we, they, they did this um, in, well, in Europe during the uh, plague, they did it during the Spanish flu around the world, they did these same things back then and they are effective. Some of the ones that, um, that we talk about a lot are things like just We've, we know that sleeping, a full night's sleep, eight hours or so, is very effective at um, improving the immune system. That lack of sleep is deleterious to the immune system. Similarly with uh, nutrition, good nutrition is extremely beneficial to us. Um, and, and some of the other ones, maybe uh, consider eating fewer animal products because a lot of these zoonotic diseases arise from uh, pig farms, from chicken houses. I've been to chicken houses that had over 100,000 chickens in one building. They're absolutely massive. And they have avian influenza that just affects the chickens in those places. And the, um, the ones with high lethality, they can go and check on the chickens in the morning and they'll be fine. And that evening, they'll come back and all 100,000 chickens can be dead. That's how lethal some of these avian influenzas can be. And then some other suggestions there just uh, that are maybe pretty obvious. And then when do we go back to a new normal? I, I'm not sure we ever do go back to a normal like we're used to. There'll be some changes. Uh, maybe, boy, I, I'm optimistic thinking that if people are vaccinated, that maybe by summer uh, 2021, we may be able to start uh, returning to some activities, having parties, things like that. That would be, that would be great. Um, but COVID-19, like I said, may be a seasonal event. 
I wouldn't throw away your mask. We may be using those for a long time to come, and we may be social distancing to some uh, 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 part to, for a year, two years to come. Business routine, obviously, will be re-examined. I was just speaking to uh, somebody the other day, a, a lawyer, and they have two uh, floors of very nice, very expensive offices. They're rethinking that. Maybe they don't need all those offices. They found out that people can work remotely often. So maybe they're getting rid of one of those floors. Uh, maybe physicians are changing the way they operate. And a lot of our businesses are doing the same. And the last one, you know, handshaking may be a thing of the past. We may not be shaking hands. We may not be uh, uh, sharing things like we once did in the office environment. Cubicles may also be a, a thing of the past. Uh, before and before I get to this slide, one thing I just want to mention about is I don't have a special slide on this, but kind of conjecture on future pandemics. Future pandemics, and, and two of them are obvious. Uh, influenza, every year we're concerned about an influenza pandemic because it's always there. We've had them before. We will have influenza pandemics again. So that's one. Second is uh, coronavirus. We've had uh, severe acute respiratory uh, syndrome, SARS. In, in 2012, we discovered a new coronavirus called MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. It's currently in uh, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and it's a pandemic. It's from bats to dromedaries like camels to humans, and it has a 3.5% mortality rate. And then, of course, COVID-19. So coronaviruses are always out there. They could always uh, reemerge. Two other ones that I just want to touch on quickly. Uh, the third one is already in some ways a pandemic, and that's uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria like MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or uh, Versa, vancomycin resistant, are already out there. I, I, you know, we're seeing more of these infections. They'll continue because bacteria are really good at reproducing, overcoming obstacles we place in their path. And so uh, we're going to see, you know, I, I remember back in the 70s, you know, gonorrhea, with a shot of penicillin, but now we're seeing antibiotic resistant gonorrhea that antibiotics can't cure anymore. And there's other diseases, other staph, other types of strep that are becoming antibiotic resistant. And the fourth one that uh, is certainly a strong candidate for the next pandemic is, as I mentioned earlier, a biological weapon, a biological bioterrorism agent. It just takes one case of... Um, smallpox to be an uh, international catastrophe. Um, and, uh, you know, as I mentioned er earlier about the biological agents, um, smallpox is interesting. It's not a zoonotic disease. And what that means is that it was only in humans. Once we, um, once we vaccinated humans, then we were able to get rid of it because there wasn't a host in, uh, in animals to reemerge. Uh, the last smallpox case was 1977 in Somalia. The following year, we had a lab worker in England died of smallpox exposure. And in 1979, the World Health Organization declared it eradicated. And there's only two places that we know currently are samples of smallpox. One is CDC in Atlanta, Georgia. And another one is a village or a town in Russia that also has it, as far as we know. And then finally is this slide here. It kind of uh, describes some of the issues and concerns that we have with infectious diseases, particularly um, uh, zoonotic diseases. If you remember uh, Conrad's Heart of Darkness, Kurtz is floating down the river and he has this, uh, appears to be an infectious disease, and he dies before he gets to civilization and treatment. And so it doesn't spread. But these days, you can be in the middle of Africa, South America, Arctic, or the bottom of the Grand Canyon, and be to Hartsfield International Airport in just a matter of hours. And so with example, COVID, you can be respirating that, spreading it to other individuals before you even know that you're ill. You can spread it to your family. And so that's concern as the population grows, the time that it takes to travel the globe is decreasing exponentially. And so uh, that that's, will continue to be a concern and there'll continue to be a greater need for surveillance for zoonotic issues. Uh, just, just finally, I just let me end up with, if you're interested in further uh, reading on this, there's a, a lot of books out there, a couple of them, uh, kind of older now, 90s was Laurie Garrett's The Coming Plague is really good. 
uh, kind of give some background and some history on, on all these that we've talked about. And another one is more graphic on Ebola called The Hot Zone by Preston is also uh, really easy, quick reading. It's, it's, um, it's really something. Um, and so I, I think I'll end there. I'm happy to talk about any, answer any questions that I can that you have on here. And now I guess I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Rollinger for, for some Q&A. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Rowan. That was just wonderful. Hi everyone, I'm Dina Rollinger. It was really great looking at the participant list and seeing so many familiar names. Uh, we miss seeing you in person, but we're glad you were able to join us online. If you, again, if you look at the Q&A button, you'll be able to add a question or comment. And I have one already from Marion. Um, if you are unable, let me say, if you're unable to type into the question and answer, you can raise your hand and I will get to you that way as well. So Marion has some great questions. So can you please go over the stages of infectivity of COVID? Is it true that someone contracted COVID from a dying person, they would not be contagious the next day? How long would it be before they were contagious? Would exposure to someone with a mild case of COVID be less risky than someone that was dying of it? Okay, great question. Boy, that's a lot of them. Uh, see if I can go to order here. Uh, the, the dying one, viruses don't live long in, in corpses. They die off pretty quickly. We found this for uh, other things. So it, I, theoretically it is possible. But let me preface that as I think about it is one of the exciting things about uh, COVID-19 is what we don't know. There's a lot we do know about coronaviruses in general, but COVID-19 is new. We're still learning a lot about it. And so uh, we're fortunate that we there's a lot of room for experimentation and research on this area. What we know is it, it's not a single vir virus that makes us ill. It takes several, um, probably a thousand of the viruses to get us ill. So yes, if a person is dying of it, they're probably, what that means is their viral load is very high. Their cells are lysing, they're, they're producing a lot of the viruses. So they would be much more hazardous, perhaps, than somebody that is not as sick. Having said that, you can't look at somebody and determine their viral load. It just takes one droplet inhaled into our lungs to get a person sick from uh, COVID-19. So it's hard to predict the viral load and how sick uh, they're going to be. But like I said, people become infective uh, before they experience symptoms. Usually three to five days, they can start uh, uh, breathing out the virus and they may not experience the actual symptoms until the day or two or three after that. Kathy gave you two thumbs up for your presentation and recommendations. And she also adds that David Plawman's book, Spillover is an excellent on zoonotic diseases. Thank you. You're absolutely right. Thank you for that. Are there other questions or comments? You can also try raising your hand. I see something in chat. Oh, yes. You also got a shout out for your recommendation for the hot zone. I had to read it in 10th grade. It was scaring, scarring, but amazing. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, Brazelton Labs uh, was in that book. It's where they had uh, what's called the Reston virus, which is Ebola. I applied for a job at that lab uh, two weeks before that happened. I, I never heard back from them. I didn't know why, but when I read the hot zone, I realized the timing was exactly right. Uh, so that's where we first found out that Ebola could be aerosolized. You could actually, the primates in that lab actually inhaled uh, the Ebola or Vienna uh, virus and became ill from that. So yeah, it is a, it is a scary book and, and don't read it during a meal. <laughs> so Marion has another question. She asks, are there any updates on the long-term negative permanent side effects of COVID? Well, that's a great question. It's really interesting. Um, what we're hearing uh, is that COVID is, is not like, um, for instance, the cold, uh, other, another, uh, colds are often also coronaviruses, that people often stay sick for weeks or months and, and don't recover right away. And so uh, we're still finding that out, but it, it turns out that some of the symptoms are not just the ones I showed you earlier about the fever and chills and the muscle aches, but actually it can have neurological impacts and um, 
circulatory impacts. So it, this is actually, the more we study this, the more we find out how serious it is and how deleterious it can be on a person for days, weeks, months, and maybe longer. So it, it really is a, a, a frightening disease in that respect. Our friends, our friend Sam Staley has a question. He asks, given what we know now about COVID-19, what should the public health response should have been? And what would we do if anything different? I think often we need to look at what other countries are doing that are effective. And it's, it's not an issue of, for instance, I'm not trying to get political, but open or closed economy. It's an issue of essentially throttling the economy. And so in what we saw in New Zealand, Australia, and some parts of Europe is when, and, and in Israel right now, when the rates of disease go up, they pull back. And when they go down, they then move forward with businesses and socializing among the population. What we need to do is uh, make sure that uh, us as individuals are behaving correctly and that our leaders are giving clear instructions on how best to avoid getting sick individually. And that's often, you know, doing the simple things. Public health is often about individual behavior of wearing the mask, social distancing, and things like that to keep from getting ill. And so as a, as a community, state and country, we need to do our part because it's, uh, we need to remind ourselves, it's not about me necessarily not getting ill. It's more important that I prevent another person from getting ill, in my opinion, that if I can keep another person from getting sick or certainly dying, it's not that much of an inconvenience for me to wear a mask for a while to, to make sure that happens. Mariana has a question. She asks, what is the efficacy of the first round of immunizations? Should we be concerned about the pressure to come up with a vaccine quickly? So the FDA has been uh, um, testing and licensing vaccines for many, many decades. I used to work at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, and uh, they do this a lot and they wouldn't, uh, and they've gone through stage one, looking at um, the toxicity of these vaccines, stage two, where they do comparisons and now stage three, looking at different cohorts of people that receive the vaccine compared to those that do not receive the vaccine and see about difference in efficacy there. I'm confident that whichever vaccines are approved by the FDA uh, will be safe. I plan on taking the vaccine as soon as possible. Uh, Partly, I want to go back to normal life as much as I, I possibly can. But no, I, I, I do believe that um, the thing is the downside to getting this wrong is so extreme in, in both health, you know, morbidity and mortality, but also maybe um, in, in terms of the legal fights that would happen. So I, I, am, I am confident that they, they know how to do this and they'll do it well. So Robbie has some great questions. Are all of those old viruses, Spanish flu, Black Plague, SARS, et cetera, still out there somewhere? Or did they go extinct? If they are still out there, why don't we hear about them anymore? Also, what does this suggest about the long-term future of COVID-19? Uh, great question. Okay, so the Spanish flu was H1N1. We had, this, we had an outbreak of H1N1 in 2009. It was really interesting about that, uh, just quickly, it was almost the same virus. I mean, the two of uh, the Spanish flu and that one were very similar. So the question is, well, why didn't we have the high morbidity and mortality in 2009 that we had in 1918? And it looks like the answer is the human population has changed. We've had, we've been exposed to other influenzas of H1N something and H something N1 that we weren't as susceptible to that, um, that disease. The other ones, black, the plague, uh, plague is still out there. You hear about plague um, in sheep shears out west and in Australia where they around sheep and animals, they still get plague. It's still out there. It's still in rats and, and mice. SARS seems to have disappeared. Uh, COVID-19 is very similar to SARS, but it, SARS just seemed to, to disappear. We're not sh quite sure exactly why. Um, and about COVID-19, great question. We don't know what the future of COVID-19 is, quite honestly. We'd like to think that once we get the vaccine in place, it'll go away like SARS did, but there are no guarantees for that. And, and um, I wish I could say be more confident, but I don't, I don't want to be too confident here. 
So Mariana said, thank you very much for your answer. However, she expressed um, some concern over trust for the CDC and FDA at this time. You're, you worked in the business of epidemiology outside of academia for a number of years. Is there anything that you would like to say about that? Yeah, you know, I, I worked with CDC for a couple of decades actually on grants and I worked with them on different programs. Um, and I, I, I understand what you're saying. There's a frustration because there seems to be the perception, if not the actual reality of politics getting involved with CDC and the FDA process. And I, I totally get that. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm also confident there are laws in place and there are a good, I know for a fact, my personal knowledge that there are good people that are in charge of the process underneath the political appointees that will make sure this happens correctly. But, you know, I, I get there's concern because there certainly has been, in my view, a perception of uh, the politics getting involved in this. So I, I'm not sure how else to answer that, but I, I, I share some concerns, but I'm also confident in the process. So Vitorito at Vitorio, sorry, asks, what can we expect in terms of a timeline for administering enough vaccines to achieve herd immunity? Is there a concern about the emergence of additional strains or limited efficacy that could complicate this process? <laughs> yeah, great question, absolutely. We don't know again how long vaccines will uh, provide immunity yet? Is it a year? Because there's a high likelihood that the COVID-19 will mutate either by antigenic shift or drift, in other words, a light, a small change or a large change, it can definitely happen. And so uh, that's what the trials are about is trying to find out how long they provide immunity until we get to the point where we have herd immunity, where we're not transmitting it easily to other people. Some people won't be able to get the vaccine because of pre-existing conditions. And so uh, we don't know about the timeline because we don't know when FDA will, when they'll be ready. We don't know when FDA will approve it. And we also don't know how many uh, doses of vaccine there will be. Now, I, I think the federal government's bought many, many tens of millions of vaccines already or, or ordered that many. But you know, there's 330 something million people in the U.S., and then all of a sudden, and all the other people in the rest of the world. So it may take a while to get around. We may not be vaccinated, um, even if everybody does it. Right now, we're at 50 percent have said that they want to be vaccinated. But if everybody's vaccinated, it may still be next summer before everybody's um, had the opportunity to do so. Marion asks, um, "What are the chances that COVID could mutate so much that the vaccine wouldn't work when it came out?" Yeah, great question. And so uh, much like influenza, you know, every year we get new uh, vaccines for influenza because there is the, 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 the mutation of the virus that picks up new avian or new swine or new whatever uh, genetic material. So it mutates. So we need new vaccines every year. In a similar way, we're still finding out how prone to shifting and drifting the COVID-19 is. We, uh, nobody really knows yet how likely that is but we do know it's a, it's a possibility. So even if, even if we get a 95% effective vaccine this year, it is possible that it could mutate and require something different. But if we get enough people vaccinated with this year, we can actually uh, remove and make the current strain extinct. So it can't, it can't mutate, it can't come back. And so that's our hope is, kind of all together to get rid of this thing so it doesn't come back. Great. Ken asks, would you comment about the differences between one dose and two dose vaccines and the efficacy difficulty in getting the second dose administered? Well, yeah, we've seen this in the past. Uh, hepatitis B vaccines, other ones that are two doses, uh, shingles, two doses that whoever, there's a drop off. So whoever gets the first dose, some percentage don't come back for the second dose. The first dose will have some efficacy, but apparently not as much obviously as the two doses. That's why the Johnson and Johnson vaccine of one dose is so attractive. It's essentially, hopefully one and done, but none of them have been approved. But if they have a choice between one dose and two doses, obviously we'll go with the one dose for the reasons you mentioned it gets into uh, sociological issues 
where some, you know, people can't just keep taking off from work or can't pay for this or pay for that. And so it, it really becomes, uh, it could be very onerous even to get, go from one shot to two shots to get universal coverage. So it is a, a huge issue. The Haley wonders, how do you think COVID will continue to affect international travel in the next year or so? Do you think travel restrictions will hold or will things become more lax before vaccination is widespread? Oh, wow, that's a tough question. Good one. Um, so what we're seeing, um, it, it, see, I'm hoping to travel to Europe this coming summer, right? So I'm really hoping that it doesn't affect that. My concern and is that it will, that uh, what we've seen with uh, other diseases all the way back to the plague of the 1340s is that if, they're cons if a town is not willing to let a person into their community that might make them sick. And even so, even though they may be losing tremendous amounts of money, in this case, in the form of tourism, they will err on uh, keeping it shut. And the reason for that is very simple, is nobody wants their children to get sick and die. And so it's often just something simple as that. Uh, money and the economy is very important, but our families are even more important usually. And so uh, I would say that hopefully by next summer we'll be traveling. That's my own personal hope, as well as our hope that we'll have uh, immunity by that time. Great. I, I don't see any hands raised. Does anyone want to raise their hand? I have a, another question popping up in the Q&A, but I want to make sure that I'm giving people a chance for raising their hand as well. So I'm sorry, I, I made your hand go away. Can you raise it again? My apologies. And I will ask this question and we'll get you up next. I think it was Rita. Marion asks, does a COVID survivor still need to be cautious in public or for a short while at least, are they free to be around anyone without any concerns of contracting it again? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I think the honest answer is we don't know yet. There have been stories internationally of people that uh, had COVID-19 test and then got better. I mean, actually manifested the symptoms, got better, tested negative, and then came down to again, it seemed like another infection. But the answer to your question is we don't know. I would be very cautious around it. Um, it's likely that a person could have immunity, but this, we simply don't know how long that immunity lasts. And you don't want to, you probably don't want to get sick again if you were sick or even asymptomatic. And you certainly don't want to transmit it to somebody in your family or somebody that uh, you're around. So you still need to, if nothing else, you'll get mean looks if you just walk around without a mask. And so uh, that's, that's one reason, but yeah, we all need to kind of get in this together, I think. Okay, Rita, you might have to unmute yourself. It looks like you have to unmute yourself, but then you can ask your question. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Okay, if I can tell just a little story in support of um, mask usage, um, you know, Dr. Rowe and I was activated in the state EOC back in March. Uh, for the COVID uh, response. And at the height, we had about 300 um, people in the EOC sitting elbow to elbow. What we found was when um, people came into EOC to work and unaware that they had COVID, that if they wore their masks and they were around people who wore their masks consistently, they did not have secondary spread with the COVID. However, when people came in and did not wear their mask consistently and were around people that also didn't wear their mask consistently, that's where we found secondary spread. So the mask works even if people are elbow to elbow working for 12 hours a day. Thank you. Thank you. That is exactly right. In fact, you're probably working with a lot of my students. Well, I had a lot of students working at the EOC doing contact tracing and doing some other work over there. Uh, so anyway, thank you for doing that. You're absolutely right. Uh, masks work. We've known that for hundreds of years and they'll work now. And again, they'll not only protect our health and protect others' health, but you're, Ms. Smith, you're absolutely correct. Uh, couldn't have said it better. Great. So Ken has a question. Um, how likely is it that a COVID survivor 
or a discharged patient will still be contagious? Um, not likely. And so if, if you've gone, if, if, you've, if you've, your symptoms have ended, I, I'm trying to, it's been a while since I did contact tracing, so I, I forget the rules, but uh, I, somebody help me here, but I think it's three days after the final symptom, they, and you, certainly if you test negative, they consider you no longer symptom or no longer contagious. You can't transmit the disease. So they are unlikely to uh, discharge you from the hospital under normal circumstances, uh, normal patients, while you're still being contagious generally. But uh, if you don't have any symptoms, if you had symptoms and you don't have any symptoms anymore, and if you go at least six days with no symptoms, you're almost certainly not going to be contagious any longer. Great. Do we have any other raised hand questions? In the meantime, I'll ask um, if we can get Rob Nixon piped in for a moment. Folks are asking, saying great presentation and they're wondering, they can see that it's being recorded and they're wondering where they can view it and how, and how soon that might be. We do have a YouTube station that will be able to make that available. Rob, can you give us more info? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I'm getting a weird echo here. Um, you can uh, email me and I list, which is uh, my email is rnixon, like Richard Nixon, at I will put you on our um, contact list to send out information. Uh, you can also check my social media sites. We will have a recording of this and all of our other policy pubs available later on YouTube. Uh, is there something else I'm missing here, Dana, that they wanted to know? No, nope, that's perfect. It's in the comment section in case you did not hear him, but I'll repeat it. His, our director of communications is Rob Nixon. His email is R-N-I-X-O-N. That's R-N-I-X-O-N at fsu.edu and if you email him you can get the information regarding how to view the recorded version of the pub and if you're not on our list already we'll be happy to put you on the list so that you learn about future pubs and i are there any other questions or comments we'll give it one more second and i'll I'll tell you about our upcoming pub before we say thank you once more to Dr. Rowan. We, our next pub, since we did not have one in September, we're having we're doubling up in October. So our next pub will be actually be on October 20th. It will feature Dr. Audrey Heffron Casserly, and she is from the college's Emergency Management and Homeland Security Program. And her talk is titled Intended Consequences the role of fringe movements in civil unrest. So that again is on October 20th, and it'll be at the same time. Information will come out shortly. If you'd like the information and you're not on that list, please email Rob and we will get it to you. I see, let me see. I see one more question in the Q&A. Uh, Sam is asking, what state seems to have handled COVID-19 the best? You know, it's hard for me to answer that because they face different challenges. New York has responded strongly, but they have a very different population than Georgia or Mississippi. But it's uh, generally the ones that have a clear leader that is saying, this is what we're going to do. And so it's somebody that you can listen to, but also somebody you can criticize uh, uh, has done well. But I, I'm, I'm not sure I can pick a particular state because all of them have had difficult in difficulties in different ways. So I'm, I'm not sure I want to shout out to any one state. Uh, but I, if, you know, by the way, let me just say one thing. Johns Hopkins COVID website is excellent for comparing not just uh, countries, but in the United States, you can compare states and counties within Florida. That's really helpful to look at not just numbers, but more importantly, trends across the different states and counties. And so if you have a question about how your county, state, or other states are doing, uh, Johns Hopkins COVID site is really excellent. 
And we had another question come in from Marion. She's wondering if you could talk a bit about climate conditions that might be favorable to COVID. So cold weather versus humidity. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, so I guess I have two thoughts on that. Um, when I first said climate, I, I was thinking climate change, and that will increase zoonotic diseases exponentially, perhaps in the near future, as insects, mosquitoes, and all that can move further north. But your question is more on climate conditions uh, regarding uh, the temperature and humidity, which is is also critical. We know the idea uh, that high humidity favors viruses, uh, life. They live longer than middle and even low humidity levels. Uh, the thing with low temperatures, uh, viruses do fine in low temperatures generally. Uh, who doesn't do well are people. And so what happens is when cold weather, of course, we all go inside and that's why influenza, cold and COVID-19 rates, I think will go up as people get colder, they move inside. But in terms of environmental conditions in your house, dry conditions, uh, cooler conditions, HVAC system that um, actually filters out viruses or at least keeps it air moving is a much healthier environment than of course still air. And outside, uh, I'm a big proponent of being outside uh, as much as possible. Uh, Mariana asks about the, the data that we get on COVID rates and COVID deaths. And she's wondering to what extent can we consider the data that we're getting in Florida and elsewhere trustworthy? Um, a good question. You know, uh, I'm not sure of the answer to that. I actually uh, know the person that's in charge of the state data, uh, and she swears they're doing it just the way you're supposed to do it biostatistically. And I'm also familiar with the person that was in that position, and uh, she swears that that her method was the right way. Um, what I can say is, uh, is that first of all, I'm not sure about the data right now. It's hard to look at what uh, when you're doing surveillance data, it has to be cleaned up and looked at. And I think, so we may not know right away, but when we look back on that, the truth will come out. We'll find out who was correct. My understanding is they are counting correctly the number of people that are positive uh, and the, the deaths correctly. Um, but I don't have any um, um, source that I, as objective source, I can say one way or the other, to be quite honest with you. Okay, well, it looks like our last question for the evening is one about a follow-up regarding air circulation. So is recycled air in an airplane or in a building a hazard or should it be filtered? Re recycled air. Uh, so in airplanes, generally most of the air is fresh air that comes in on an airplane. Uh, so it's a little safer. Recycled air though is, uh, you know, absolutely you need to be concerned about that. Uh, it, it is kind of half hazard. Now, HVAC systems have filters, but not just any filter will take out viruses. Viruses, as you know, are, are very small. And so um, recycled air, yes, you can you can recycle bacteria, viruses. You want fresh air is it. And uh, the more fresh air you can bring into environment, the safer, the lower the risk is for that environment. So uh, recycled air is generally not nearly as healthy as uh, others. Uh, fresh air. Dr. Rowan, thank you so much for giving us your time this evening and for this really, really valuable information. I know I learned a lot and I know our audience did as well. And thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. We hope that you will join us again later this month on the 20th for our next pub. Thank you and good night. Bye everyone. Thank you everybody. Appreciate it.